بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد We'll start quickly by just some revision questions from last lesson Ahsan, what was the seventh principle? Uh, taking the initiative to begin your learning and taking advantage of your youth Very good um, What was the hadith of the person that we mentioned? Uh, Benefit, uh, take advantage of five before five. So, uh, so then take advantage of five before five, yeah. Um, you before your old age, your health before your sickness, your uh, wealth before your born, your time before your busyness, and your life before your death. Very good. Most of all, what harms a person in regards to this uh, principle? The author mentioned a few things that. Harm a person in regards to this principle, which is to hasten and seeking knowledge. Uh, okay. What I'm thinking about, I think I'm getting confused with the eighth principle because it was an Imam al Dhuhri that said uh, the one who wishes to seek knowledge um, can also, like, whoever takes it all at once, whoever tries to take it all at once, will leave it all at once as well. That's the next principle. Uh, procrastination. Procrastination. Um, I said. I said that's fine. Um, Adam, what was the eighth principle? Um, don't be hasty after you've started seeking knowledge. Don't be hasty in taking it out. Or don't be hasty in taking it all at once. Trying to attain all of it at once. Good. I said. Sit down. Um, so what's your name? Levan. 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 Yeah, um, mention a proof for this principle. To not be hasty. Yeah. Uh, huh. I can't remember the Arabic, but I know the, Gone to the English. So the disbelievers would say, uh, why wasn't the Quran sent now? Why wasn't the Quran sent now? Okay, I sent. Uh, what was the ninth principle? Okay, I sent. Salman, what are the different types of patients that you need? Having patients while studying and having patients while teaching. Okay, I sent. Yeah, I'll see you again. Ahmed. Ahmed, what was the first principle that we took? Purifying the attention of something. No. Purifying the, the, the vessel. Very good, Ahmed. Hamza, you talk. No, I talk. Uh, Sayyid, what are the four things, or the four principles, or the four intentions that we need when seeking knowledge? The intention to relate and learn from oneself, the intention to relate and learn from the people. Uh, in worship, uh, no, not to improve the worship. To, uh, make sure that worship is according to the Quran. No. One, you, you mentioned to mention the other two. Attentions of seeking knowledge. You mentioned removing ignorance from yourself and from others. Send it, send it, send it, send it. Spread the, the, that one. That's, that, that's removing the ignorance from others. That comes under that. Huh? Come on. I, I keep forgetting everyone's names. Adnan. Adnan, yeah. Act upon the knowledge and to Act upon the knowledge and to preserve knowledge. Good. What were the three points that the Sheikh mentioned in how we can have high aspirations or how we can focus all our attention to seeking knowledge? All mentioned in one hadith. All mentioned in one hadith. Ahsan.
Seeking help from Allah, the second one. Go on, Salman. I have a question about so the state to our benefits of our duty. Must I be allowed as for myself when I tag his dog to tell people? Very good, I said. So focus on that which is beneficial, seek her from Allah, and then do not deter from the uh, past. Uh, under the principle of following the correct path of seeking knowledge, Hamza, what are the two things that the Sheikh mentioned that we should do? Uh, sorry, what was the question? Under the principle of the principle number five of taking the correct path of seeking knowledge, he mentioned two things how you can have the correct path. So uh, the second one is uh, choosing a chef that benefits. Good. The first one was uh, is it studying matun that's widely available. Memorizing a matun which is recommended by the ulama. No, Hassan. Uh, Hassan, what are the characteristics of a teacher that you that you should have? Uh, second one is that he knows how to uh, he knows how to teach. No, before uh, that, before that. Before that. Um, yeah, so so one is sincerity, nasiha. Okay, say nasiha instead of sincerity. It says sincerity, you think ikhlas. It's nasiha, which is a bit different, yeah, because nasiha is a bit more, uh, a bit more wide of a concept. So nasiha is one as the other. And one is benefit. What does that mean? He benefits. As in, he has um, taken knowledge from. No, he's qualified. He's taken knowledge from ulama. He, he has he has the Okay, uh, in terms of nasiha, so the characteristic of nasiha for a sheikh, what does that mean? Um, so was that divided into um, the knowledge itself um, that is being advised on, i.e. that it is uh, on the sound of either a quick understanding? That's, that's part of it, but it's not the actual point. Okay. Was the other one that um, he was qualified to teach, had the ability to teach? No, no, no. no. So the teacher, he has, he's, like he mentioned, two, two qualities. Is qualified and he has nasiha. The qualified we've done. Yeah. Nasiha is two things. What does it mean for him to be a nasih? Two things. He mentioned one of them before by accident. Uh, that he was able to teach. Not able to teach. Uh, yeah, he knows how to. He teach. knows how to teach. Yeah. That's one. And the other. He wonder like sound aqidah. Sound aqidah comes under that. Yeah. Come under this. Uh, he's qualified in his knowledge. That's that's the first uh, 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 right, uh, he's, he's a guide for the student to follow like a role model. He's a suitable guide and role model for uh, the student of knowledge. And that firstly includes his aqidah, and then it also his, then includes his conduct and mannerisms and everything else that follows after that. So aqidah is part of it, uh, but it's not restricted to just that. You know, somebody could be just because somebody has sound aqidah doesn't mean just follow that person because. You may cause more harm than he does. He does good. Um, right. Uh, I'm not going to ask everything, but just as you guys revise the previous lessons, make sure you keep revising the, the the previous principles that we've taken from the beginning. Yeah. Especially this book, I would really advise that you summarize the book. Each chapter you summarize into your own uh, few points and so on. Because especially especially this print, you know, it's a lot of pages. Yeah. Uh, I think the PDF is 130 pages or something. That's a lot to flick through. But you could summarize it, each principle into half a page at least, you know. So that means all 20 principles you'll have in 10 pages. So instead of flicking through 134 pages, you got the main points that you need in 10. And any, anything extra, you can just come back to uh, the book. Okay, we're on al maqid al Ashir, the 10th principle that the Sheikh has mentioned now. Is on? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> <laughs> English, 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 just the title. Oh, the 10th principle, adhering to the etiquette of seeking knowledge. Okay. Uh, one thing, subhanAllah, I want to point out, I sneezed. Before I said Alhamdulillah, I can hear people say Alhamdulillah. 
يرحمك الله إذا replied والحمد لله. So you should wait for the person to say الحمد لله and then say يرحمك الله and then he replies after that. You know, I'm not even, sometimes I'm not even finished sneezing on the guys. <laughs> He's already saying يرحمك الله. Yeah? Okay. على كل حال the tenth principle is regarding adhering to the etiquettes of student knowledge. Now we mentioned this book is about this. And the author actually hasn't, you know, he mentioned some of the other principles from sincerity and so on, but he's not actually talked about the importance of uh, adab. He talked about in his introduction, the importance of venerating knowledge. And now after he's mentioned some of the, you know, foundational points, now he's, he's making that statement. Okay, halfway through the book, showing the importance of uh, these etiquettes. And the reality is that you are, you are not able to understand knowledge and attain beneficial knowledge except with etiquettes, except with adab. And that's why later on we'll have the statement of Yusuf ibn al-Hussein where he says, Bil adabi tufhamul ilm. Through knowledge, uh, sorry, through etiquettes, knowledge is understood. Through etiquettes, knowledge is understood. So that will come inshallah. But that is basically the you know summary I could say of, of this chapter, showing the importance of mannerisms. And uh, we're going to mention other stories, uh, other points as well that further show this, which is that the Salaf themselves, the Salaf themselves, they would give precedence to seeking knowledge about et or, or learning etiquettes before seeking knowledge about everything else. And the Sheikh mentions a number of points. So to summarize this uh, principle, it is that you cannot attain beneficial knowledge except with uh, etiquettes. And that is shown by two things. Firstly, uh, the statement of Yusuf ibn Hussein, where he says, Bil-adabi tufhamul ilm, that through the etiquettes is knowledge understood. And secondly, the different narrations of the uh, of, of the Salaf, of how they will give not only importance to learning etiquettes, but precedence to etiquettes over learning the Islamic, uh, the other Islamic uh, sciences. Now. <laughs> قال ابن القيم في كتابه مدارج السالكين أدب المرء عنوان سعادته وفلاحه وقلة أدبه عنوان شقاوته وضاوره فما استجلب خير الدنيا والآخرة بمثل الأدب ولا استجلب حرمانهما بمثل قلة الأدب والمرء لا يسمو بغير الأدب وإن يكن ذا حسب ونسب وإنما يسلم للعلم من تعدد بآدابه في نفسه ودرسه ومع شيخه وقليله قال يوسف قال يوسف قال يوسف بن الحسين بالأدب تفهم العلم لأن المتأدب يرى أهلا للعلم فيبدل له وقليل الأدب يعز العلم أن يضيع عند سأل نعم رجل. نعم ابن القيم يا الله مرسي عليه سأل إن بوك مدارج السالكين the manners of a person are the sign of their ultimate happiness and success and a lack of manners is a sign of their wretchedness and destruction the good of this world and the next have not been caused by anything quite like manners, and being denied these two things has not been caused by anything quite like a lack of manners. A person cannot rise to nobility without manners, even if, even if he is one of the noble ancestors and lineage. The only one suitable for knowledge is the one who adheres to his et etiquettes in himself and his study and with his teachers and companions. Yusuf ibn Hussein said, through etiquettes, knowledge is understood. This is because the person having good etiquettes is considered one deserving of knowledge, so it's granted to him. Whereas the one who is ill-mannered, knowledge is too honorable to be lost with him. Now, so he starts off, the Sheikh starts off by mentioning a statement of Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah. And it's a good background uh, to the topic. And he mentions how the mannerisms of a person is a sign of their ultimate happiness and success. And that is because through these etiquettes, you are able to benefit from the goodness in this world and in the akhirah. And without these etiquettes, you will not gain that benefit. Hence, he carries on to say, And a lack of manners is a sign of their wretchedness and uh, destruction. And then he continues to the end of the quote. And it's a very uh, profound quote. I mean, all the, all the quotes in this book are, are very uh, profound. And then he mentions some lines of poetry. And then he says uh, a very important line where he says, وَإِنَّمَا يَسْلُحُ لِلْعِلْمِ مَنْ تَأَدَّبَ بِآدَابِهِ فِي نَفْسِهِ وَدَرْسِهِ وَمَعَ شَيْخِهِ وَقَرِينِهِ The only one who is suitable for knowledge is the one who adheres to his etiquettes in himself, in his 
study or darsi in his lesson يعني, and with his teachers and with his companions companions meaning classmates he says here the only one suitable for knowledge is the one who has these etiquettes with all these different people now remember in the beginning we mentioned that etiquettes are of six uh, these etiquettes or these rights are six types right so it's not when you say etiquettes it's not restricted to just your teacher even though that would be one of the main ones but it also extends to the knowledge itself to your classmates to the place that you're in to the knowledge itself and so on with all six that we mentioned uh, previously and then so the, this point of his the only one suitable for knowledge is the one who adheres to the etiquettes we understand from that is that if a person does, a person cannot be cannot become a scholar if he does not have these etiquettes so a person does not have these etiquettes he won't reach that high status of being a scholar and it's only through those, those etiquettes that he will get them. Then he mentions the statement of Yusuf ibn Hussein, Bil Adabi Tafhamul Ilm. Now, I've heard, I don't know the correct way of saying this. I've heard Bil Adabi Tafhamul Ilm, which means through etiquettes you will understand knowledge. And I've heard Bil Adabi Tufhamul Ilm, which means, Mustafa? Tufhamul, so. Different with Tafhamul and Tufhamul. So you would be bestowing the understanding, teaching essentially. No, no, no. This is, this is Naibul Fa'il. يعني to understand. It's not فهمه. It's not that. It's تفهمه أو تفهمه. Okay, so the. يوسف. Yeah. Yeah. So بالألبي تفهم العلم means through knowledge you will understand, and بالألبي تفهم العلم through uh, sorry uh, through etiquettes you will understand, and بالألبي تفهم العلم through etiquettes knowledge will be understood. So, so the the dua the file is not mentioned. Okay. <laughs> So the, 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 that's, that's more for the, the Arabic students, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> you could be something hidden. Oh, what have you got there? In the, in the, you got that from, yeah? Yeah. But what's translated here, what's translated here? Through etiquettes, knowledge is understood. So they've translated tufham, not tufham. That's, that's something we can look into, inshallah. <coughs> and then he gives a reason for that. So after mentioning that statement, he gives a reason. And he says, This is because the person having good etiquettes is considered one deserving of knowledge. So it is granted to him. Whereas the one who is ill-minded knowledge is too honorable to be lost with him. When a person is etiquette, then he becomes a vessel which is suitable for knowledge to be placed in. And when he does not have those etiquettes, then he's not a place, uh, he's not a suitable place for that knowledge to, to, to remain in. So he won't attain knowledge. And this from a number of different aspects. Firstly, even from the aspect of the teacher, if the teacher sees somebody, who does not have good etiquettes, he, he won't go out of his way to teach that person. He won't, maybe he might teach, but he won't go out of his way to put, you know, to put extra effort to make sure he understands. We mentioned stories of Shafi'i, how with uh, was it Rabi'ah, last lesson we mentioned how 40 times in class he would repeat stuff to him, and then outside of class he would repeat the same issue just until he understands, because he's very beloved to him, he had those etiquettes and so on. But if you get a student who do, does, not, does not have those etiquettes, and because of that, that's obviously going to lead to a teacher not being fond of him. The teacher is not going to um, you know, put in that much effort with that student. And the teacher is not losing out. It's, it's a student who's losing out. And that's why uh, when you studied Hayat Talib Ilm, one of my teachers, Sheikh Abdul Hamid al-Husri, when he came to the chapter of etiquette with your teacher, he summarized it with one principle. He summarized that whole chapter of having etiquette with your teacher, with your Sheikh, in one principle, which is... The sheikh will not give the best of what he has until you give the best of what you have. The sheikh will not give the best of what he has until you give the best of what you have. So that's what it is. So etiquette in how to ask the question. If you don't ask the question properly in the correct manner, do you think the sheikh is going to answer fully with full uh, zeal and mention no, he's gonna. He just wants to get rid of you, okay? Now this is always the case, but it's a, it's a general principle, right? So that the sheikh will not give the best of what he has until you give the best of what 
uh, you have. And also another reason that Sheikh Arsami mentioned, Sheikh Arsami mentioned that through these etiquettes, you also gain the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because now it is a suitable place for that knowledge to remain in. And if you do not have those etiquettes, the etiquette for that knowledge, then it will not be a suitable place and you, you won't necessarily gain that help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ustad, how would you have etiquette with your teacher when you may be different with your teacher in a certain matter? No, differing is fine. Differing is fine. This is fiqh issue, me and you uh, differ. Now, some, some etiquettes differ from time to time, right? So, for example, right now, I don't mind you asking a question like this, okay? But if there's like a thousand people, you wouldn't ask that because that's just going to disturb the whole class. You ask, and he's going to ask, and he's going to ask, and he's going to ask, and so on, yeah? And, uh, and, and so on. But there's nothing going, uh, there's nothing wrong with your teacher to go to them and say, look, uh, Sheikh, you mentioned this. You don't turn around and say, you're wrong, and I disagree with it. You say, Sheikh, how do you understand this hadith? And how do you answer this hadith? And then, once speaking to the sheikh, then you just then you can mention, you, know, you can mention. It. But then there's it. It depends on the, the issue, the time and place. Do you do it in front of everyone, or do you do that privately and so on? So, for example, if it was like uh, Surah Salata one, then um, then uh, that, that wouldn't be a place for you to uh, disagree with the teacher openly. It's a beginner's book. There's no need to go into khilaf, right? If it was a high level book and then you are close to know the sheikh, then no problem. The sheikh would mind. So it does differ from time to place. So a lot of these etiquettes, some of them differ from time to place. We're going to talk about the next uh, the next chapter. We're going to talk about muru'ah. Muru'ah as well, that differs from time to place. And the Shaykh is going to mention a number of examples. We'll discuss that a bit more, inshallah. Now. سأل رجل البقائي أن يقرأ عليه فأذن له البقائي فجلس الرجل متربعا فامتاع البقائي من إقرائه وقال له أنت أحواج إلى الأدب منك إلى العلم الذي جئت تطلبه ومن هنا كان سلف رحمه الله يهتمون بتعلم الأدب كما يهتمون بتعلم العلم قال ابن قال ابن سيرين كانوا يتعلمون الحديث كما يتعلمون العلم بل إن طائفة منهم يقدمون تعلمه على تعلم العلم قال مالك بن أنس لفتى من قريش يا ابن أخي تعلم الأدب قبل أن قبل أن تتعلم العلم وكانوا يذحرون حاجتهم إليه قال مخلد بن حسين لابن المبارك يوما نحن إلى كثير من الأدب أحواج منا إلى كثير من العلم وكانوا يوصون به ويرشدون إليه قال مالك كانت أمي تعممني وتقول لي اذهب إلى ربيع تأني ابن عبد الرحمن فقي أهل المدينة في زمني فتعلم من أدبه قبل علمي وإنما حرم كثير من طلبة العصر العلم لتضييع الأدب فترى أهدهم متكئا بحضرة الشيخ بل يمد إليه رجليه ويرفع صوته عنده ولا يمتنع عن إجابة هاتفه الجوالي أو غيره فأي أدب عند هؤلاء ينالون به العلم أشرف الليل بن سعد على أصحاب الحديث فرأى منهم شيئا كأنه كرهه فقال ما هذا أنتم إلى يسير من الأدب أحواج منكم إلى كثير من العلم فماذا يقول الليث لو رأى, لو رأى حال كثير من طلاب العلم في هذا العصر A man asked uh, Bukai if the man could read to him so Al-Buqa permitted him to do so The man sat cross-legged the man sat cross-legged, so Al-Bukha refused to let him read and said to him, you are more in need of etiquette than in knowledge which you came to see. It's because of this that the pious, the Salaf, may Allah have mercy upon them, used to give importance to learning etiquette just as they would give importance to learning the knowledge of itself. Ibn Sarin, may Allah have mercy on him, said, they used to learn the way of behaving just as they used to learn knowledge. Rather, a group among them used to give precedence to learning etiquette over learning knowledge itself. Malik said to a young man from Quraysh, O oh nephew, learn etiquettes before you learn knowledge. They used to demonstrate their need of it. Makhlad said to Ibn al-Mubarak one day, We are in greater need of a great deal of manners than a great deal of knowledge. They used to advise others about this and guide others towards it. Malik said, My mother used to put on my turban and say to me, Go to Rabi, Ibn, uh, meaning Ibn Abdurrahman, who was a great scholar of fiqh amongst the people of Medina in his time. And she, she said, Learn etiquettes before you learn his knowledge. The one thing that has prevented many of the students of our time from gaining knowledge is that they lost the etiquettes of doing so, such that you see. 
such that you see one of them reclining in the presence of the Sheikh, perhaps even stretching his legs out towards him and raising his voice in his presence, not withholding from answering his mobile phone and other things. So what manners do such people have by which they can achieve knowledge? Latham and Sa'ad, may Allah bless him, him said, uh, he came across a lot of people of hadith and he saw something which is which appeared as though he disliked. He said, what is this? You are more in need of little manners than you are in need of a lot of knowledge. What would a lay say if he saw the condition of many of the students of knowledge of our time? Okay, then the Shaykh, uh, Hafizahullah, may Allah preserve him. He mentioned a few, um, uh, he mentioned the statement of Al-Buqa'i uh, in the beginning to show that you know he wasn't impressed with the students and, and uh, that's why you know he, he wasn't zealous to teach him because they didn't have those 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 etiquettes and then after that the sheikh he says uh, it is because of this that the pious predecessors used to give importance to learning etiquettes and then the sheikh mentions a proof for that that the salaf would give importance to etiquettes by the statement of ibn sirin they used to learn the way of behaving um way of behaving the actual arabic hadi hadi you could say is guidance and it's referring to here etiquettes. So they used to study guidance, i.e. etiquettes, just as they used to learn knowledge. So that's the proof for um, the fact that the Salaf would give importance to etiquettes. And then the Sheikh goes a step further. Not only did they give importance to etiquettes, but in the minhum ala Rather, a group amongst them used to give precedence to learning etiquettes over learning knowledge itself. Not only giving importance, but they give presence to etiquettes over, uh, over learning itself. And then he mentions uh, a number of uh, statements from uh, the Salaf. Try to memorize at least one of them, whichever you find to be uh, the easiest. And because the Salaf gives you know that much importance to etiquettes, that's why we're starting with this book. You know, the, the two books that we're doing right now, we started with Usul al and Ta'azim al Why? Because that's how the Salaf sought knowledge. They will learn etiquettes first. And I, as you've probably seen, this, you know, Ta'azim al-Ilm is a great book. It really maps out how to seek knowledge. And you'd, you'd only truly appreciate what is in this book and the advice that the Sheikh has written once you, um, you know, in, year, in a year's time, when you look back at your journey in seeking knowledge, only then you'll, you'll realize the, uh, how valuable this advice and these principles are of the Sheikh. And how, you know, because you implemented them, you benefit. Or if only you had implemented them, then you would have benefited more. You'll, you'll realize that uh, later on. And then at the bottom of the page, he says, That the, what, the, the thing which prevented many of the students' knowledge in our time from learning knowledge is because they have lost the etiquettes of, uh, of, of seeking knowledge. So what is the cause for many students not being able to, to learn and, seek, and, and to gain that knowledge and get to the high status of being uh, from the ulama and so on, because they don't have the etiquettes. They don't uphold the etiquettes. And like, like we mentioned, the etiquettes is not restricted to a certain thing. It's more general than that, right? And then the Shah gives a number of examples of some of the, the etiquettes on the last page. He says, you'll find some, some of them reclining in the presence of the Shaykh, meaning leaning against walls or against pillars. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's a key. So I've not said this to anyone throughout Usul al or throughout Ta'azim al because you know we just started, I don't want to do too much at once. But now that we've taken this, I don't want to be see, I don't want to see anyone uh, leaning, especially if you're young. So many back problem? No back problem, right? Alhamdulillah. Right. Unless you've got a back problem or something like that, you shouldn't be uh, leaning, especially if the lesson's only one hour. Lessons five, six hours, maybe you know, after a little while, but one hour, there's no excuse to. And you'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. Yeah, we've got three, we've got two lessons a week and we got every on Saturday, you get used to it. And then, and, and the reason for that, who is the person that relaxes? It's normally some, it's, it's normally, you know, it's normally the one who is venerated, the one who is uh, the most respected. He's the one that's, you know, relaxing and sitting. If you are at home, you know, your father will be the one who's relaxing and sitting and you will be the one who's not sat like that. You'll be, you know, you'll sat before, if that tells you to do something, you'll get up and do it, right? So likewise, uh, in the presence of your, of, of your teacher, then you are not the one who is respected in that uh, gathering. Then he says, And perhaps you'll see some people, they stretch their legs towards the teacher. Stretching legs is bad manners. And the only time that would be excused if, that, if somebody has an actual problem, you know, they've got arthritis or something, or it's a very long, it's a long sitting, 
So he stretches it for like 30 seconds or something, and then he puts them back in. That's fine. But to just sit and, uh, you know, just have your feet towards uh, the teacher, that's from bad, that, that's, that's from bad manners, bad etiquette. And also uh, what included in this generally is facing your, 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 knee, your, your feet towards the Kaaba as well, towards the Qibla. Now, I hear a lot of people saying that, oh, there's no delay to say that it's haram. There's no delay to say it's haram, but it's from etiquette. Just like if your father was sat in front of you, would you do that? You wouldn't. But then nobody says, oh, there's no delay to say that. No, because it's known that that's from bad etiquette, right? So to face the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it can be avoided, then uh, uh, then try your best to um, avoid it. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying it's haram, it's from etiquette. It's from etiquette. And also, raising his voice in his presence. Huh. Same with the Quran. The Quran is in front of you. Don't put your feet in front of the Quran. Our respect for the Quran. No. And then he says, and raising his voice in his presence. Again, raising your voice in the presence uh, of a teacher is not from, from etiquette. Etiquette is that you lower your voice. And that's what happened to the Prophet. Amnu, la nabi. Oh, you who believe, do not raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet. And there are some people that they do not withhold from answering their mobile phone in class. The phone goes off. You see some people, alhamdulillah, I've not seen it here so far, but you see some people in the lessons, they're talking on the phone. Right? If you get something like that, you, if it's something uh, urgent, you ask permission for your teacher to go outside. Mashallah, some brothers have, have done so before. And then you go, you take your phone call, and you come back. Okay? Likewise, answering messages. If it's like a quick 10 second, you know, something very, very urgent, well, then maybe no problem quickly. You know, you know, something urgent has to be done. The 10 second thing, maybe you can send a message. But then to be on your phone throughout the whole lesson, it shouldn't be done. And that's why generally as well, when you sit in a lesson, you should always ask the teacher permission. And even if you're using your phone to make notes, right? The teacher will know that you're making notes. You might just think you're on your phone, right? So you should always ask permission. From your teacher, look, I'm uh, I'm gonna use my phone, but I'm, I'm I'm going to use it for for making notes. I'm not gonna be uh, like texting or anything like that. Then she like, if he gets permission, then he gets permission. That's fine. For ayu adabin inda ha ula ina luna bihi alim. Then she says, so what manners do such people have by which they can achieve knowledge? When we talk about these etiquettes, people are doing this. What, what, what where's the mannerisms then? Where where is the adab that we are talking about? How do you think they are going to learn? Huh? So it depends if like my mom texted me. It depends what it was. <laughs> depends what it was. If he said. If she said, uh, after Salah, you should go to the shop and get this. You don't need to reply. After Salah, you just go. Yeah? If there's something that ring me now or something like that, then, yeah, then, then that's different. And then he mentioned the statement of uh, Latham and Sa'id, that he saw some people of Hadith, and he saw some things that he didn't like, meaning they didn't have those etiquettes. So he, 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 he addressed it, and he said, you are, in, you are more in need of a li little bit of manners than you are in need of a lot of knowledge. I mean, you're trying to learn all this knowledge, but you don't need that knowledge right now. Right now, you just need the basic of etiquettes. And then, the, and then the, the sheikh finishes off by mentioning um, what would uh, Alayth say if he saw the condition of many students of knowledge in our time? You know, if, you, if that was his time, if he saw people in our time, then what would, what would he say? Uh, in regards to um, having to answer a call or go to the bathroom, what would be the edible um, requesting from your teacher? To... Um, generally, generally, um, and I'm doing, I'm doing qiyas here upon asking for the bathroom. What well, I've seen with like shower, same and so on. You just stand up and uh, I don't, I don't really know where this came from, but it's like uh, you do this, and that's like an indication that you go to the bathroom. I, I don't know where that's from. I don't know the asal of it, but it's just understood. Sorry. Yeah, it's just an indicate, or you can just do like an ishara, like I need to go. That way the sheikh understood that you need to go and you've not had to speak or anything. So I've seen Shaykh Asimi do his teaching, so he does that and the sheikh does not, whilst he's speaking, he carries on. So like, because if you get a phone call, if you just do something like that to me, I'll, I'll understand and can I go. And that way no one's getting disturbed, you can go fulfill your uh, obligation and you've upheld the manners um, as well. No. So this 10th principle is regarding how the mannerisms of uh, seeking knowledge. And, you know, some of these things you might think, you know, that's normal, but the reality is, is that the gathering that we are in, is a gathering which is surrounded by angels. And it's a gathering where the inheritance of the prophets, the prophets are being uh, uh, distributed. So if this is the inheritance of prophets, then we should uphold those etiquettes which are suitable for that type of uh, inheritance. No. قال المصنف وفقه الله المعاشر هذه عشر 
سيارة العلم عما يشين مما يخالف المروءة ويخدمها من لم يصن العلم لم يصنه العلم قاله الشافعي ومن أخل بالمروءة بالوقوع بالوقوع فيما يشين فقد استخف بالعلم فلم يعذمه ووقع ووقع في البطالة فتفضي به الحال إلى زوال اسم علم عنه قال وحب قال وحب ابن منبه لا يكون البطال من الحكماء لا يدرك العلم بطال ولا كسل ولا ملول ولا من يعرف البشر وجماع المروء كما قاله ابن تيمية الجد في المحرر وتبعه هفيذه في بعض فتاوي استعمال مما يجمله ويزينه وتنجب ما يدنسه ويشينه نعم The 11th principle, guarding knowledge from the things which, dis- which detract from it. Whoever does not guard knowledge, knowledge will not guard him. As Shafi'i said, whoever has a lack of maru'a by falling into that which tarnishes it, he has belittled knowledge and has not revered it, and has fallen into idleness. His situation reaches such an extent that the term knowledge is no longer used for him. Wahab ibn Munabbih, may Allah have mercy on him, said the idle one cannot be one of people of wisdom. Knowledge will not be gained by the idle one, nor the lazy one, nor the wary one, nor the one who seeks to please the people. A comprehensive definition of Muru'a, as the elder Ibn Taymiyyah said in Muharrar, and his grandson followed him in some of his fatawa, using that which beautifies a person and adorns him, and avoiding that which spoils and tarnishes him. No. The eleventh principle is guarding knowledge from the things which detract from it. That's a, you know, probably the best transition they can get. But what this basically means is that you guard knowledge from those things which take away from the honor or the integrity of the knowledge itself or the student. And the word which is used in the title is al muru'a. Al muru'a has a very, very important concept which a lot of people neglect and don't understand Islamically. So they have certain things, certain haircuts, for example, and they'll turn around arguing, even if it is al-qazar, it's only makruh, it's fine, and so on. Or they'll do certain things and say, they try to get all technical, but then they forget the issue of al muruah al muruah in simple terms, is not doing, uh, or doing those things, which actually, the, the Sheikh, he mentions it here. Uh, if you look at the... The, the, the paragraph after the line of poetry, a comprehensive definition of Muru'ah as the elder Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, instead of elder, put grand, the, the Ibn Taymiyyah, the grandfather. With Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he's known as Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, the grandson, and his grandfather is known as Ibn Taymiyyah al, 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 al-Jad, who, uh, the grandfather. His grandfather was also a very big scholar, and especially in Hanbali Fiqh, he's one of the uh, main, main scholars from there. So both of them are uh, very famous. Uh, and well known, and well known, and they have. And he has many books uh, as well, which are uh, very important books. But obviously, many people, many people, when you, when you say Ibn Taymiyyah, the grandson comes to mind, right? But here, the chef mentioned both, so he's mentioned the grandfather and the grandson. But anyways, what's the definition that they give? Using that which beautifies a person and adorns him, and avoiding that which spoils and tarnishes him. Two things: using that which beautifies a person and adorns him, and staying away and avoiding that which spoils him and tarnishes him. What that basically means, I'll, I'll explain it inshallah, is that you do those things which uphold your honor and integrity, and you stay away from those things even if they are not haram, even if they are not haram, but they are looked down upon, and you can get rid of a person's honor, integrity, and so on, especially a student of knowledge should stay away from those things. Especially a student of knowledge should, should stay away from those things. So, in simple terms, those things which are looked down upon in society, even if they are not haram, a student of knowledge should stay away from those things. Would this uh, also apply to doubtful matters as well? It would apply to doubtful matters as well. No. I'm going to give examples. Okay, okay, let me get the examples first. Better to understand. And then after that, I'll take, I'll take a question, inshallah. So a number of examples, right? And, and indeed, these do differ from time and place. Because remember I said, it was looked down upon by society. So in different communities, different countries, it could be different. Different centuries, different times, it could be different as well. But for example, um, not wearing a hat, especially as an imam or so on, right? That goes against muru'ah, not wearing a hat. No one's going to turn around and say it's haram. And if, let's say, I turned up one day and I 
I forgot my hat in my other soul, for example. And that's Salah. Salah still accepted, right? And maybe if it's a one-off like that, you know, it's, it's fine. But it goes against Muru'ah. If you had the Imam of Mishnah Nabi, for example, come up and he leads Salah wearing jeans, what would you think? And let's say they're not tidy, none of that, it's all, it's all fine, right? It doesn't come in the copy in the kufa, and none of that, it's all halal, okay? Even then, what would you, what would you think? You think that the Imam of Mishnah Nabi shouldn't do that, right? It's not refuting. I mean, even if he came with a thob without his shimal, with, with this in Saudi, this is a gone upon. Uh, I'll mention your story, yeah? Sure. The Fajr one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, mashallah. Badran mentioned the story to me. Harith Badran. He was in Mecca and one of the Imams you know, told him to lead Salah, Salat al Fajr. So obviously he's in Mecca, you know, one, one of the other masajid. So he was a bit nervous, right? To lead Salah there. So after, you know, he's. And I'm gonna preserve him. He's he's revising what to recite in Fajr. Yeah, he gets there, and the other Imam who told him to read, he's like, "Where's your shimag?" And he said, oh, "I've been so focused on going over. I'm gonna recite. I forgot the shimag." So the Imam said, "All right, leave it. Leave tomorrow. I'll leave today." Why? Because he didn't have the shimag. It's not from Muru'ah. It's not from uh, Muru'ah. See, Alhamdulillah, we benefit from one another. Yeah. So uh, even eating and standing up. For example, or drinking, standing, or whilst walking, shouldn't be done. Someone will hadith to saw that from you, they won't accept hadith from you. And that's a condition, you know, if you study Musallah hadith, from the conditions, uh, there are five, we'll study them later, of uh, authentic narrator, authentic hadith. The first is that the um, <coughs> narrator has to be trustworthy. What does it mean trustworthy? There's a number of things, okay? One of them is it has to have muru'ah. So you cannot, in, in, in hadith, a person does not have this muru'ah, then you want to, you wouldn't be considered trustworthy and you want to take the hadith from him. That's how strict they were. That's how strict the hadith were. And it's very important because, like I said, this knowledge that we are learning is not some normal knowledge. We are not in some, uh, you know, we're not some politicians that are going to speak about anything in any way that we want. We're not, uh, you know, in a circus. We're not here. We're just we're in the house of Allah in a gathering where angels are surrounding us, learning the inheritance of the prophets. Sallallahu alayhi wa so, therefore, there's etiquettes and mannerisms and muru'ah that has to be upheld for you to benefit from that knowledge. Because like this knowledge, it's a light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that light will only be placed in, in that place which is uh, befitting. So, the, then the shaykh, he starts off and then he mentions the statement of Imam uh, Shafi'i in the beginning, that whoever lacks muru'ah by falling into what, that which tarnishes him, uh, he has belittled knowledge. That, that, so, this book is about venerating knowledge, Right? But if you don't have the muru'ah, you fall into the, to the opposite of what the objective of this book. And he mentions, uh, he says that those people who are idle, they have nothing else to do, no ambitions in life, just want to waste time. They uh, cannot be people of wisdom. That true knowledge, that beneficial knowledge, they won't gain. They have no, just wasting their time talking about this, laughing about this. That's not from a muru'ah. And then he mentions the statement of... Uh, of uh, imitating me both uh, the grandfather and the grandson. No. قيل لأبي محمد سفيان بن عنيدة قد استنبطت من القرآن كل شيء فإن المروء فيه قال في قوله تعالى قل العفو وأمر بالعرف وأعرض عن الجاهل ففيه المروء وحسن الأدب ومكارم الأخلاق ومن ألزم أدب النفس للطالب تحليه بالمروءة وما يحمل عليها وتناكبه وخوارهما التي تقل بها كحلق لحية فقد عده في الخوارهم المروءة ابن حجر الحيتمي من الشافعية وابن عابدين من الحنفية أو كثيرة الالتفات في الطريق وعده من خوارهم من خوارهم خوارمها ابن, ش... ابن شهاب الزهري وإبراهيم الأذل والفساق والمجان والبطالين وعدهم من الخوارم المروءة جماعة منهم أبو أبو حامد الغزالي وأبو بكر ابن الطيب من الشافعية والقاضي عياد 
اليحسبي من المالكية أو مصارعة الأحداث والصغار وعده من الخوارم ابن الهمام وابن نجيم من الحنفية ومن أخل بالمروءة وما وهو ينتسب إلى العلم فقد افتضح عند الخاص والعام ولا ولا ينال ولا ينال من شرف العلم إلا الخطام It was said to Abu Muhammad Sufyan ibn Unayna, you have extracted proof for everything from Quran, so where is exemplary conduct found in it? He said in the statement of Allah, where he says, show forgiveness, enjoy what is good, and turn away from the foolish. Show forgiveness, enjoy what is good, and turn away from the foolish. It contains exemplary conduct, good etiquettes, and noble manners. From the most important of the personal etiquettes that a student should adhere to is having good conduct and the things which this brings about, and keeping clear of the things which detract from it, like shaving the beard, as Ibn Hajar, Ibn Hajar al Haytami from among the Shafi'i scholars and Ibn Abidin from amongst the Hanafi scholars, both considered as an example of poor conduct. Likewise, a lot of looking around while on the path, this was considered an example of poor conduct by Ibn Shihab al Zuhri. And Ibn Ibrahim and Nakhai, Nakhai from amongst the others. Nakhai, Nakhai. Nakhai. As is stretching out your legs when in a gathering of people without any need or necessity to do so. This was considered an example of poor conduct by a group of scholars, Abu Bakr al Dabdushi from amongst the Malikiya and Ibn Qudama and Abu Wafa ibn Aqil from amongst the Hanbali scholars. Likewise, accompanying the vile people and the defiantly uh, disobedient, the impotent. And the idol. This was considered an example of poor conduct by a group of scholars. Amongst them was Abu Habib al Ghazali, Abu Bakr al Tayyib from amongst the Shafi'i scholars, as well as Al Qadi Iyad al Yahsubi from amongst the Malikiya scholars. It's constantly wrestling with the latest events and minor matters. This was considered an example of poor conduct by Ibn Humam and Ibn Rujain from amongst the Hanafi scholars. Whoever is lacking in good conduct and attributes themselves to knowledge is exposed to both the experts and the general people and achieves nothing from the honor of knowledge except ruins. Okay, and then after that, the Sheikh, he mentions the proof and he mentions the story of uh, Sufyan Ibn And it was said to him that you've extracted, you know, all these rulings from the Quran. Where's Muru'ah in the Quran? And he mentions the ayah and then he explains the ayah as well. So try to memorize that whole statement of uh, Sufyan Ibn Try to memorize the whole thing because he's mentioned uh, you have the you know, you, you've got the scholar who extracted it, you've got the ayah, and you've got his explanation as well. And then he mentioned some of, uh, after that, he mentioned some of the ways in how, uh, some examples of those things that go against Muru'a. Now, the first one example, the first example that he mentioned is something haram, okay? Uh, and then after that, he mentioned some uh, other things which are not haram. So the first thing that he mentions is um, shaving, the, shaving the beard. The first is uh, shaving the beard. The second is, looking around a lot whilst on the path when you're walking you're just looking here and then there and you're looking there and then looking behind you okay that, that, that's not from muru'ah from muru'ah is that you like the Prophet said when you come for salah alaykum bis sakinati wal waqar when you come to salah have sakin of tranquility waqar have dignity you know you just walk if you look at look at the alive see how they walk slowly just looking down and that's it you don't see them doing all of this uh, all, all of this stuff uh, and the uh, number of reasons for that, obviously, looking everywhere, you might end up looking at something which is haram. You also end up, even if it's not haram, you look at things which you don't need to look at. And even that, the ulama talk about. When you start looking at things which you don't need to look at, then that uh, busies your mind from pondering over things which could have been uh, beneficial. Um, and, you know, then it also shows maybe you've got some sort of fear or something. Why are you always looking back? Are you scared of something? And so on, right? So, all of these uh, reasons. Uh, are some of the reasons why it's not considered from a muru'ah. Then another example given is not to uh, stretch the legs in, in places where uh, the people gather. So obviously we talked about uh, gatherings of knowledge, but even in other places, not only knowledge, you know, you should not uh, spread your feet without any, as you mentioned, without any need uh, or uh, necessity. And then another example is uh, always being around those people who are uh, disobedient, those people who are batal, idle, they have nothing else to do except from waste time. Always being around these people. And then after that, the next paragraph, uh, even hanging around with people who are much younger than you. So you're 14, and you always hang around with your teenagers, for example. If there's a benefit to it, you're teaching them, you're benefiting, you're trying to keep them away from the streets, so you're just trying to do, you know, like some sort of that, 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 that's fine. But 
in the sense that you're going chill, you're with them because basically you want to chill with them. Yeah, you then crack your jokes with them, and that's not from Ru'a. You stay with people you're honest, right? So, so these are some of the examples that some of the Sheikh, the Sheikh mentioned. And for each one, he mentioned who of the scholars uh, mentioned. As you can see, these are these are things which are widespread amongst all the mazahib. It's not something restricted to just a certain mazhab or anything um, like like that. Now. In regards to how we should dress to the classes, I mean, sometimes we wear some of the more casual um, robes, sometimes yeah. wearing uh, maybe joggers or jeans, sometimes wearing caps instead of clothes. Yeah. Sometimes, well, a lot of us don't wear the shiva. Yeah. As students, how would you advise us coming to these groups to to dress? Yeah. In terms of dress code and how would that be from considered from muru'a or from etiquette in uh, in a masjid or in a gathering of knowledge, it is that you try to wear you, you wear the best clothes that you have. Right, because at the end of the day, you're coming to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many people who go to a job interview, they wear the best clothes they have, then they come to pray salah and they wear in pajamas, even though they've come to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have a conversation with Him in uh, in salah. Uh, now, in terms of the details, like I said, all of these things differ from time and place. So, what, what you're right now, okay, short sleeves and so on in Saudi is considered not from Murua, okay, they, they've banned it as well, right? Yeah, that's how you know you're not allowed to wear it. But you gotta find how much is it? Five hundred, hundred real. You gotta find. Yeah, it's only recent. It's only recent. Uh, yeah. Towards the end of my time. Um, but in Morocco, for example, it's Morocco, also, right? It's normal there. It's normal there, right? So that shows that in Saudi, it's not from Rua. And here, it's uh, in Morocco. It's fine. It's just normal. Okay. So likewise, it depends on the time and place. So if in UK somebody's not come with the shima, I wanna say it's not from Rua. But if possible, at least try to wear a thobe and a hat. You know, you, you, obviously not non Muslims don't wear that, but generally Muslims are coming to Masajid on Jum'ah and so on, they'll wear a thobe and hat. So that is something which, you know, it's something, something good to wear. But if somebody does come wear, wearing something else, as long as it's not considered, it's not looked down in society, you're not coming pajamas. You come in, you know, decent clothing, which is fine and accepted by society, and that, that should be uh, fine, inshallah. Thank you. Okay. So, well, what your teacher is going to be because that's just not from the Ayah. You come wearing the shirt, would that be outdoing your teacher? Wallah, it depends on the time and place. It depends. In Saudi, if the Sheikh didn't wear it, soon she still wear it because that's considered. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe like, so if a Sheikh came from outside Saudi, in Saudi, he couldn't wear it because that's not his clothing. The students should still wear it. Um, in UK, no. I don't think so because uh, see many times uh, some the, the du'at will. Uh, in fact, it's a good sign. It shows that you know you want to learn. Uh, it all depends on time and place. It all depends on uh, time and place. If you're wearing the bish, then that, that's a bit too far. You know, the bish is a club. <laughs> that, 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 even inside, no one wears that apart from apart from the elite. Okay, uh, princes and teachers, and so on. We had one student who was in the first semester of Ma'had of the Arabic Institute. You know, learning Hazar, Kitab, and Zayi Qalam, right? And all, all he had seen is Sudais and Shireen on the TV wearing the bisht. And so he came in class wearing the whole thing. And uh, all the students thought he was a teacher and he couldn't speak word of Arabic. And then he realized that, okay, you know, I, <laughs> I shouldn't be wearing this. So um, Allah, it, it all depends on the time and place. It all depends on time and place. Now. Okay. Uh, the first, uh, no. no. The first principle is choosing righteous company for seeking knowledge. Now, this translation, see, this problem with translation, things are lost in translation. The word intikhab is different to ikhtiar. Ikhtiar means to just choose. Intikhab is choosing, but choosing the best. Choosing, uh, what's it called, the creme, yeah? Or, I was gonna say cream, <laughs> the creme, okay? Uh, choose, choosing the creme, i.e. the elite, the best. So, it's not enough for a student of knowledge just to try to surround himself with people who are considered practicing. If the word practicing is correct, even the word practicing, uh, you know, it's not the most precise, best word to use, but let's just go with that for now, because it's, everyone understands what it means. A student of knowledge, his, he shouldn't just have any random practicing person. 
he should have the best. He should have those practicing people who have high ambitions and also learning. He should surround himself with like-minded people or even those people who are better than him. Why? Because he's, he's on this goal, he's on this mission to seek knowledge. Some practicing people, when you say practicing, they pray the five salawat, but then they won't sit for the lesson. And if you're trying to learn, he'll say, you know, if you're with him, he'll say, you know, I attended last week. I'm not, he, doesn't, he doesn't really, you know, he, he doesn't really care that much. So he said, I'll pray. And then after that, I'm going to go, you know, I attended last week. I think that's be enough. That's going to have an effect on you. And you're going to now, um, uh, that could cause you not attending that lesson. You'll be like, okay, I'll, I'll stay with this person, for, for example, right? Whereas on the other hand, you feel lazy one day, but you're surrounded with those people who are serious. You say, no, 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 you have to come to that class. You're tired, one hour class, you sleep after the class. You come to that class and you end up benefiting from that class, all right? You're talking about, right, we got, we got Arabic common on the weekend. We need to prepare a, a conversation and we need to pick partners, right? Um, I've not picked a partner. You know, friends like, you know what? I've not got a partner. Come, let's partner up and now we can. Uh, we, we can do that homework that the teacher has sent, uh, has, has said. If you didn't have someone like that, then what would happen? He, he wouldn't push you to do, uh, to, to benefit. The point being is that, and there's many other scenarios that can be mentioned. The point being is that you should choose the best of companionship when it comes to seeking knowledge, because that will aid you in your uh, seeking of, uh, of knowledge now. فالإنسان مدني بالطبع والتخاذ الزميل ضرورة لازمة في نفوس الخلق فيحتاج طالب العلم إلى معاشرة غيره من الطلاب لتعينه هذه المعاشرة على تحسين العلم والاجتهاد والاجتهاد في طلبه والزمالة في علم إنسانية من الغوائل نافعة في الوصول إلى المقصود ولا يحسن بمقاصد العلاء إلا انتخاب صحبة صحبة صالحة تعينه فإن للخليل في خليله أثر قال أبو داود والترمذي والسياق لأبي داود حدثنا ابن بشار قال حدثنا أبو عامل وأبو داود قال حدثنا زهير ابن محمد قال حدثني موسى ابن وردان عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الرجل على دين خليله فلينر أحدكم من يخالد يقول الراغب الأصفهاني ليس إعداء الجليس لجليسه بمقاله وفعاله فقط بل بالنظر إليه لا تسحب الكسلان في حالة كم صالح بفساد آخر يفسد عدوى البليل إلى الجليل سريعة كالمجد يوضع في الرماد فيخمل والجليل هو الجاد هو الجاد الحازم نعم people of people are communal by nature having companions is an absolute necessity amongst people the student of knowledge needs to accompany other students so that this accompanying may support him in gaining knowledge and working hard to seek it having companions in knowledge if it's free of ordeals is beneficial in arriving at the intended goal it's only right for a person seeking to excel to choose good companionship which will aid him since close friends have an effect on each other abu dawood and at tirmidhi said and the wording here is that of Abu Dawood, and the translation of which is Ibn Bashar narrated to us that Abu Amr and Abu Dawood narrated to us saying Zuhair Ibn Muhammad narrated to us saying Mus'ab Ibn Wardan narrated Musa Ibn Wardan narrated to us saying Abu Huraira radiallahu anh said that the Messenger والسلام, said a man is upon the religion of his close friend so let him let each of you look at who he takes as a close friend. Al-Raghib al-Afsahani said, the influence of a companion over his companion is not by statements and actions alone, rather even by looking at him. The poet said, do not accompany the lazy one in his condition, for how many a pious man through the corruption of another became corrupt. The effect of the idle person on the resolute person is rapid, like a piece, piece of blazing coal put on the ashes is extinguished. The word jaleed here means the one who is earnest and determined. Okay, so the Sheikh, he starts off by saying, فَالْإِنسَانُ مَدَنِيٌّ بِالطَّبْعِ A person is communal by nature. So a human, right, is from his nature that he mingles with other people. And he lives with other people. And he intermingles with other uh, people. Hence, what Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْزَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا O oh, mankind, we have made you from a male and female, and we have made you into different tribes and nations so that you may get to know one another. And also in the word insan itself, 
right? Some have said insan is from the word nisya, uh, nasya, that they forget. However, what seems to be more correct is that it's from the word uns, or any sayyana so unsan, that you find comfort in others, that you find comfort in others. That's what insan is called, because he can't live by himself. So if you see a person who's always by himself, generally, you know, you pick up on that and you realize that's not something normal, right? But the norm is that people, you know, you meet with each other and you have friends, whether big group or small group of friends, you still have, you know, some sort of friends and you intermingle and so on. So that is natural. That is something which is natural, right? So if that is something natural and likewise in seeking knowledge, it is something which is needed for to aid you in that uh, path of seeking knowledge. That's why he says, وَاتِّخَاذَ الزَّمِيلِ ضَرُورَةٌ لَازِمَةٌ فِي نُفُوسِ الْخَلْقِ and the student of knowledge needs to accompany other students. If he's always by himself, you know, there's a lot of obstacles, a lot of hardship. He might not be able to take it by himself. But when he's with others, that helps him in uh, treading upon that, uh, that path. And then Sheikh uh, talk, talks about it, and then later on he also mentions what I mentioned previously. He says, it is, not, uh, it is only right for a person seeking to excel. Uh, he wants to reach high statuses to choose good companionship, which will aid him since close friends have an effect on uh, on each other. So it's not from wisdom, rather it's from stupidity to for you to friend every single person. For you to friend every single person and become like a close friend, then that is not something which is from wisdom. Rather, each person, and she's going to mention later on the different types of friends that you have, but generally you should realize each person and what their status is. Are they a friend or an acquaintance or just a person that you give salam to and so on. And once you, uh, and you should realize who are the ones that you should keep close and benefit from in terms of the religion and who are the ones that you should maybe stay away from a bit more uh, because they will not, they will harm you in your religion or they will not allow you to excel uh, as much. And once you acknowledge that, then you give the right um, of each person depending on their status or their relationship uh, to you. And then you mentioned the hadith, remember any hadith or ayah you have to memorize. Uh, the person he says, A man is upon the religion of, one, of his friend, of his close friend. So let each of you look at who he takes as a close friend. Because that close friend has an impact upon you. And many a time, that close friend of yours is a mirror of what you are. And that's why many people, you know, uh, ulama will say that if you want to know about a person, don't look at him, just look at his friends. And you realize what type of way type of a person he is. And there's many other hadith, you know, regarding companionship, the famous hadith of the blacksmith, blacksmith and the perfume shop and so on. Um, but all you need to memorize is, uh, is this hadith. And then after that, he went to the very important statement of Raghib al-Asfahani. Very, very important statement. And he says, Laysa jalisi li jalisihi. The influence of a companion over his companion is not by statements and actions alone, rather even by looking at him. Even just looking at somebody who you're already always around, that has an effect on you. And especially in nowadays, what do you think best uh, this uh, statement best, best applies to? What do you think? Dress code. Not dress code. Not dress code. Social media. Your, your, the phone. Mm. Your phones, right? And this is uh, the contemporary modern companionship that we have now. Right? So even if you don't speak to people face to face, you're speaking to people here, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of that. Right? So that has a big effect on a person. Some parents, they'll be very eager upon the child not hanging around with certain people in real life, but then he's talking to worse people online. Right? That's a form of companionship. And what, what, what does he say? Uh, and even if you're not talking to people, even just going through and all the adverts that come up or uh, these different reels or, you know, whatever the shorts or whatever they may be, you know, all of this has an effect. Even if you're not directly speaking to them, it's going to have an effect because they say even looking, even just looking at these things are going to have an effect on you. So you have somebody who's always indulged in, in looking at these things, it's, you know, and it's very easy to fall into, especially with reels and shorts, right? You look at one Islamic and two minutes later, you've gone through a hundred and you're watching, I don't know, a cat video or something. Yeah, It's very easy to, to get, you know, that's the whole point of it. Right, uh, what's it called? What dose is it? The, the, the dopamine dose, right? So, uh, it's very you know, it, that's what it's designed to do, but that has an effect on you and your concentration and your seeking of knowledge and the love that you have for, for the knowledge, and it takes you more away 
from that. So that's why it's very important that when we talk about companionship, take in consideration this mobile device. Uh, it's quite a specific question. Would you say that then staying away from things like reels and shorts and TikTok is part of more in the modern? You, you as a student now should try to stay away from them, yeah. Um, and uh, if it becomes something apparent, then obviously it, it would dis dishonor you. Norm normally you just stay by yourself, right? So I would recommend the Muru'ah because it's not something out. You can just, you just at home looking at. So what do you want to recommend the Muru'ah of Allah? Uh, no. So we'll go to that. وإنما يختار للصحبة من يعاشر للفضيلة لا للمنفعة ولا للذة فإن أقد فإن أقد المش فإن أقد المعاشرة يبرم على هذه المطالب الثلاثة الفضيلة والمنفعة واللذة كما ذكره شيخ شيوخنا محمد الحضر بن حسين في رسائل الإسلام فانتخب صديق الفضيلة زميلا فإنك تعرف به قال ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه اعتبروا والرجل ممن يصاحب فإنما يصاحب الرجل من هو مثله وانشد أبو الفتح البستي لنفسه إذا, إذا ما اصطنعت أمرا فليكن شريفا شريفا لجاء شريفا لجال زكيا زكيا حسب فنذل الرجال كنذل النبات فلا, لل فلا للثمائر ولا لل حطب ويقول ابن مانع في إرشاد الطلاب وهو يوصي طالب العلم ويحذر كل كل الحذر من مخالف السماء وأهل المج وأهل المجون والوقاحة والسيء السمع سمعة والأغبياء والبلداء فإن مخالفهم سبب الحرمان وشقاوة الإنسان وكأن هذا عين قول سفيان بن عنينة إني لا أحرم جلساء الحديث حديث حديث الغريبة لموضع رجل واحد ثقيل فقد يحرم المتعلم العلم لأجل صاحبي فحذر هذا فحذر هذا السنف فإن تزيأ بزي بزي العلم فإنه يفسدك من حيث لا تحس. Okay, you know, just for the sake of time, I'll just, uh, I'll just explain it, inshallah, without reading the English. Um, after this, uh, the sheikh, he, uh, from this uh, paragraph where he says, he should only choose for his companion, uh, companion one who is a company for virtue. In this paragraph, he mentions, and he's, he's mentioned his sources, and he's also mentioned in Hadith Talib al that the companionship that you have, the friends that you have, are of three types. Either, Sadiqu, uh, Manfa'ah, uh, uh, sorry, the first one is Fadila, a companion of virtue. The second is Manfa'ah, companion of benefit. And the third is companion of Ladha, um, enjoyment or pleasure, right? Meaning either you hang around with someone because there's some pleasure you enjoy yourself, or there's some benefit to that person, or there's some virtue in that person, whether virtue in terms of the religion um, or, or any type of virtue, something which is. Um, of, of high uh, lofty status. The type of person that you should always be with is the one who you gain that virtue from, whether it's a scholar, a student of knowledge, uh, and so on. And then he mentions the statement of Ibn Mas'ud, where he says that judge a person by the one that he accompanies for a man only accompanies one like him. And that was what I was referring to previously. And then on the last page, right at the end, he mentions the statement of Sufyan ibn Ayna, and he mentions how he would sometimes prevent those who are sitting a rare hadith, like a hadith that has, that's not normally known or it's got a lot of, it's some rare fawai from the hadith. He would have that knowledge available, but he wouldn't teach it to everyone. Why? Because there was somebody in there who did not, who was not uh, worthy of that knowledge. That was that person was not worthy of that knowledge. So because of the people that you are accompanying at that time, he they were prevented from that knowledge. That's why it's very important that you choose um, the correct uh, companionship. Uh, if you got salah, if you got time for salah, so you got a question uh, after salah. Um, inshallah, we stop here. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to grant us beneficial knowledge. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ilaha illa Allah.